Good morning. We are continuing our series on doxology. We are now in week three, and fortunately we've progressed the word. We've moved past the word praise now into the very second word, the Lord, of the very first line of verse one. As you can see above uh, this morning is focused upon the object of worship. Now, as I've explained in weeks past, this word or this phrase that we have here in the first line, you'll see there in verse 1, praise the Lord, comes from the Hebrew halul iyah, which is the, the foundation from which we get the phrase hallelujah. Praise the Lord, which is what it means in English. Hallelujah coming from this original Hebrew phrase, which we get via the Latin alleluia, which you usually see with an A first. And so having now explored that concept of praise, which for those who haven't been with in previous weeks, we've explored both the verbal nature of praise as well as the vocational nature of praise. The fact that our worship and glorification of the triune God is both verbal in our prayers, our praise, our songs, that is to say our hymn singing, as well as our proclamations of scripture. It is also vocational, as we saw last week. It is the very reality of what our life as Christians should and indeed must be, that our worship is not meant to be relegated to time on a Sunday morning, but rather our very life and walk in the ways and the commandments of our Lord are to be a living expression of our glorification of God as we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, as we saw from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So here this morning, having then covered those two bases, we now see the latter half of this phrase, hallelujah, or hallelujah, which is the very obvious ending, the Lord. You'll notice there that in the majority of your translations, it should hopefully have it in what we call the majuscule form, which is the small capital letters. This is indicating to us in English that it is the divine name that is being used here. It is not just simply the generic reference to God, be that in the form of El or Elohim in the Hebrew, nor is it just simply a reference generically to Lord, like we have many times, particularly in the New Testament in the Greek. This is a specific reference to the divine name in its shortened form here, Yah, short for Yahweh, as his name that comes to us from Exodus chapter 3 and his meeting with Moses in the form of the burning bush. To whom, as I whom shall I say, has sent me. I am that I am, or I will be that I will be. This is the name that God gave for himself to Moses to take back to the people of Israel. And so here we see that the object of said praise is in fact the Lord. Now, if this were a a kid's lesson for little tiny tots, we would just end it there and go, ta-da, because it seems very obvious and almost rudimentary on the surface, does it not? Praise the Lord. There you go. Who is to be praised? The Lord. That's how simple it seems. Yet, nevertheless, we actually find when we explore the way in which this terminology is being employed, not just in this psalm, but indeed in other psalms which we shall examine as well, we find that the reality of Yahweh, of the one true God, being the object of this phrase, halul, praise, actually carries with it quite a profound theological reality that impacts everything we do. It impacts both the verbal and the vocational nature of our worship. And so whilst it might seem rather elementary on the surface, we shall explore some very key and fundamental texts this morning from two particular places, namely Psalm 95 and Psalm 145, which we've had read to us in multiple parts throughout this morning's worship service. And so if you would turn with me first to the 95th Psalm, we shall begin our exegesis there. There are a number of key points as you turn there that will be uh, raised and and explored this morning that will be proclaimed forth around this concept of God, of Yahweh, being the object of our worship. And we shall hopefully see that, again, this is not just a passing phrase that is to be glossed by when we read it in the insipid or the opening of Psalm 150. 
If you look at me in the first five verses of Psalm 95. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Again, in the majuscule forms, the invocation of the divine name, the Lord. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Common description, uh, emphasizing it as an epithet for God. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. In typical fashion, as is common with many of the Psalms, of course, especially the ones that we've uh, exegeted and explored thus far, it begins with a call to worship, a call to praise. It says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Now, having explained, as we have in weeks past, but to refresh people's memory, the Psalms are the hymns of the Old Covenant saints, of the ancient church. This is the hymn book, these 150 Psalms that we have for us. And so many of them begin in what's called the insipid, or just simply the opening, with a call to worship that usually would have been conducted by the presiding priest to gather the saints and to direct their attention in worship. It was a call to worship. And that's why a number of the Psalms begin with this invocation or this command to join together and to sing, to praise, to glorify, to worship God. Let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us engage in this verbal nature of worship. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. This now turns to the vocational nature, right? the living aspect of our worship, coming into his presence with thanksgiving. Of course, in the old covenantal setting, particularly in the days of the temple, this was coming into the courts of the temple, gathered in the assembly, in the church of God, being led in that system by the priests in worship directed towards the God of Israel. And coming into his courts, coming into his presence, was to be done with thanksgiving. It was to be done with glad tidings. It was to be done with a great joy in the fact that God is to be worshipped, in who he is by nature, which we'll explore later on in the sermon. And coming into his presence with thanksgiving involved this attitude or this posture of worship. Coming into his presence with thanksgiving involves, of course, many things. But surprisingly, one of them does not include feeling happy. That might seem counterintuitive. But you won't, generally speaking, find the concept of thanksgiving throughout the scriptures, both Old and New Testament, attached to this notion of happiness. Thanksgiving is rather a deliberate posture. It is something that is intentional in nature. And what you do in fact find when you consider the, the whole counsel of God's scriptures is that indeed thanksgiving often is done when apparently on the surface there is little reason from our mortal perspective to give thanks. We find so many scenarios in which the saints of old were in great trial and tribulation, going through great difficulty and struggle, being assailed by many enemies. And yet the consistent command on the part of the prophets and of the priests and of the saints is to come into his presence, as it says here, with thanksgiving. We see many of these psalms written in the context of profound warfare. It's why so many of the psalms feature militant language because by context, David and others indeed found themselves amidst great strife, constantly being invaded by their neighbours, constantly being assailed, constantly being slaughtered, constantly being embattled. And yet nevertheless, even amidst great war and tumult, they give profound thanksgivings and they come into his presence with thanksgiving. This tells us something vitally important about the posture and the attitude of worship. And that is namely this. 
the object of worship is and must be the central focus, as opposed to our own personal or even corporate circumstance and context. If we were to worship God based on the ever whimsical and changing sentiments of our own feelings and states that vary daily, our worship would be, quite frankly, a mess. It would be chaotic. It would be inconsistent. It would be disorderly. It would be borderline schizophrenic. That tells us when we see this kind of language, even employed in circumstances that are both great and peaceful and glorious and yet also deep and dark and tumultuous, that if there is a consistency of a call and a command to come into his court or to come into his presence with thanksgiving, then the object of said worship, God, the Lord, must be the determining factor of the worship, not us. Not what we think, not what we feel, not how things have been going for us that day, that week, that month, that year, whatever the context might happen to be. And so this command, and make no mistake, it is a command to come into his presence with thanksgiving, outlines for us the vital Reality, the fundamental principle that the object of worship is what truly matters. God, as the object of worship, is what matters and what determines how we do, in fact, engage in worship, both verbally and vocationally. We see this not just in this phrase, but you're going to see this come up on three different occasions in the way that it's written. Keep reading with me through verse 2. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Verse 3. For, an important conjunction, which in English is demonstrating to us that the author is about to deliver to us the reason for whatever he happened to say in the previous sentence. For, the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Why are we to sing to the Lord? Why are we to make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation? Why are we to come into his presence with thanksgiving? And why are we to make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise? Because the Lord is a great God. Because he is a great king above all gods. Short, simple, terse, to the point. For the simple reason that God is the great God who is the king above all gods. It speaks to his very nature, and we'll touch on that later. It states, of course, in verse 4 and 5, that in his hands are the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountain mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Again, here the psalmist is expounding upon the incredible creative nature of the Almighty, the fact that he is the one who brought all things into being. But the pointing here in verse 3 to God being a great God, a great king above all gods, and that is the definitive reason why he is to be worshipped, praised, why we are to come into his presence with thanksgiving, so on and so forth, tells us that the object of worship is what defines the worship. The object of worship is what directs the worship, what guides the worship, what sets the basis, the parameters, the platform, the foundation of the worship. Whether we have had the greatest week in our life or one of the worst, We are nevertheless commanded to gather among the saints of God, to come into his sanctuary, into his presence with thanksgiving, and to bow down before our maker and to worship him. There is no shortage of examples of this throughout the scriptures. We see jubilant worship by Joshua and the armies of Israel upon great triumph over Jericho and the conquest thereof. We also find worship pouring forth from the mouth of Job when his life had been destroyed 
and when he had lost everything, when he had lost his family, his land, his business, his resources, assets, everything. Both scenarios, both circumstances, so diametrically opposed, yet with one common denominator, the worship of God. This harkens back, does it not, to what we saw in our series on the attributes of God, the fact that God is transcendent, that he transcends all things, that he is above and beyond all that we know and understand. This means by nature that him being the object of worship must too be transcendent. Because he transcends the menial things that occur in our life, the differences of circumstances, the pendulum swings throughout our given days and weeks and months and years, by virtue of his transcendence, it determines for us that our worship not only can, but indeed must remain consistent. We can turn to him. We can worship and glorify his name as he ought to be because he transcends our own personal, mortal circumstance. So these opening verses of the 95th Psalm communicate to us that this object of worship is God and must be God, not us or our circumstances or our own particular context. This is why we have to keep in view the object of worship. As simple as it seems, we can see there is already quite a profound reality to this very concept. The psalmist continues if you look forward in verse 6 and 7. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Here the psalmist is not necessarily transitioning, but now introducing profoundly monarchical language. It's coming off of the back of him having referred in verse 3 to God as the great king or a great king above all gods. This is where we get this notion of God as the king of kings, which originally, as we've explained before, was a Persian title for the Persian emperors that's then utilised here in the, in the ancient scriptures as a reference rather to God. He is the true king, capital K, of kings, a king above all kings, which is an imperial title. This is to say God is the divine emperor, which is what a king above other kings is. And so utilising that monarchical reference in verse 3, he is saying, come let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. He points to the fact that the Almighty is the creator and he is therefore worthy to be bowed down before in reverence and in awe and in majesty and respect and in fear and trembling. These kinds of words, this kind of rhetoric, again, is then given an explanation. See there in verse 7, for same conjunction we read earlier, he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, indeed the sheep of his hand. The very reality that he is God is again pointed to as the defining reason why he is worthy of worship and honour and glory, which we'll see particularly by the time we get on to Psalm 145. But notice this monarchical language, the imperial language. This language of bowing down and kneeling in submission, which is inherently what kneeling is, it's a sign of submission, it's a sign of reverence and respect. It harkens to the, the images of medieval times of the knight bowing down before his king in service. Bowing down to the Lord our maker, this one who is indeed our God, as he is referred to in verse 7. It tells us so poignantly yet so powerfully that our worship, our glorification, our praise, again both verbally and vocationally, is and must be done with the commensurate level of respect and reverence and awe 
that this almighty creator is indeed worthy of. When we worship him, there is to be not just an air or an atmosphere, but also a fundamental understanding and principle in the worshippers of God that is built and founded upon a posture of reverence, of deep and profound respect, of seriousness, of imperiousness in the good sense. This informs, again, verbally and vocationally, both of those natures. What does this mean in practice? Many things, perhaps on the most prima facie level and the surface level. What we do here in what we designate as a worship service, this gathering of the saints upon the Lord's day as commanded by our Lord to worship and to glorify him as the assembly or as the church of God. What we do here is and must be done with reverence and respect. We are, as the psalmist said earlier in, uh, in Psalm 95, we are coming into his presence. We're coming into his presence, into his court, into his sanctuary. We are in the presence of God by virtue of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that unifies us and not just us here corporately as a local body, but unifies us with believers around the Blue Mountains, unifies us with re believers around the state of New South Wales, around the Commonwealth of Australia, and around the world. And more so, and moreover, it unifies us with the saints who have passed on. We cover that next week. But nevertheless, we are in the presence of God here. As I prepare to proclaim sacred scripture to you to interpret, to explain and to expound and apply I am doing such with the mindset and the mind frame of understanding that my job and my calling to you by virtue of my being sent in this position is to be done with deep reverence and respect it is why I and Michael will be judged doubly harshly as you because my job is to open sacred scripture to you to proclaim it, to expound it, to apply it. And when we do this, not in some mystical sense, not in some divine sense on my part, but in as much as I am opening this text, proclaiming the word of God and applying it thereto, I am functioning, not in my own right, but by God's right, as the mouthpiece of God. Again, understand, not in my own right, not somehow apart or in some new revelatory fashion, but in as much as I am proclaiming scripture and exegeting it, I am functioning as the mouthpiece of God because this is the true word of God, which we most resolutely do believe. What kind of reverence and respect and fear do you think I have to apply to that job? I do not come here with a nice message that I thought was a good idea or with some trivial notion of anecdotes and stories about a fishing trip that I went on or about some hike in the woods and how that somehow applies to your life in some particular fashion. I don't come up here and tell jokes, and thank God. I don't come up here and bombard you with anecdotes or movie references or something from the footy. What I do is prepare myself spiritually and mentally to expound the word of God to you as a sacred act. Why? Because I very much want you to learn. I very much want you to grow. I very much want to see you walk in the ways of the Lord all the days of your life, to grow in your communion with him to become more holy as he truly is holy, to grow in sanctification as the Spirit of God works in your lives. I absolutely want that for you. But do understand that with the deepest respect I say, the primary, the foremost, the foundational reason why I am doing this is because God is worthy. If there were 30 people if there were 300, if there were 3,000, 30,000, 300,000, 3 million, or three people 
in here or before me, nothing would change. Nothing would change. This series would still run if no one was here. And I would walk in here and I would do my job and I would stand here and I would preach it because God is worthy. And the mere utterance of his truth is a sacred act. The mere proclamation of these words into the ether of the world is in itself a righteous act. It does not matter who's here, how many are here. He is worthy. And the fulfillment of my duties before him is not dependent upon myself nor yourselves, but upon the object of our worship, which is God. And so we must do this with reverence and respect. We must come into his sanctuary here with reverence and respect, understanding that we are joined together you know, something that is far, far, far beyond ourselves. We aren't just here to individually partake in this individual act of coming to church, but we are gathering with the saints, as I mentioned earlier. We are joined by the very same spirit who has indwelt billions of people across the millennia, who has unified us in the one true Lord. We're joined in that. And again, as I mentioned, we cover that next week. But when you hearken these doors for any occasion, but particularly upon the Lord's Day to engage and to partake and fulfill your Christian duties in worshipping God, enter this place with reverence and respect. As glad as we are that you're all close and, and friends and like each other and are happy to come together and to see each other and to chat and to fellowship, which is brilliant, all right? Glory to God. And we have morning tea so that, and lunches that people can, we can fellowship together as his people, which he, which he certainly enjoys and which in itself is an act of worship. Again, that vocational nature, our f Monthly feasts are an act of worship because it shows the unity of God's spirit and his people. But when we come in here, the question perhaps that one and every one of us should ask ourselves, what have I done to prepare myself for the task that I'm about to undertake? What have I done this morning before getting here to prepare myself to worship God in his presence? What have I done over the last 24 hours to prepare myself spiritually and mentally to proclaim the truth of God, to worship the very creator of all the universe, to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion? What have I done to, do, to prepare myself for that? Right, one such example is I will fast through Saturday evening and Sunday morning for the very simple reason that I want the elements of communion to be my first meal of the day. But upon rising on the Lord's day, this is what I first partake in. It's enjoined, of course, with prayer and thanksgiving the night before, this morning of, etc. But the spiritual preparation to come into his presence, to make sure that our mobile phones are on silent, <laughs> to make sure that when we come into this place, we're coming with an attitude, right? A disposition, a posture. I am hearkening the sanctuary of God. I'm joining in his temple that is his people. And I am going to be in the presence of God. Our time before the worship service, again, it doesn't mean we ignore each other. It doesn't mean we don't say hello. I'm not saying any of that. What I'm saying, though, is that the time before the worship service should be, generally speaking, designated for prayer and meditation, for preparing yourself as coming into this place with the reverence and awe of the reality of what you're about to undertake as your Christian duty, preparing yourself spiritually and mentally to worship God. And again, this principle goes forth to everything.
It goes forth to how the worship service is then actually conducted. Again, having intentionality behind why we do what we do. There are a lot of effort has been put into constructing the liturgy that we undertake or that we perform here. Things that we do from the praising, the hymns, the prayers, which are all written, by the way, so that thought has gone into it. In order to write a prayer, you have to have thought through what you're going to write as well as which particular scriptures are read, the opening exhortation, the benediction, so on and so forth. And we're still working on that, still going through and doing our job to make sure that all those aspects of the liturgy that we do for God are done with deep reverence and respect and with thought and intentionality behind why we do what we do. But having that disposition is so vitally important To be able to say that our worship is commensurate with these kinds of words and this kind of rhetoric that we see, this concept of bowing down, kneeling before the Lord, our maker, our creator. So if you would turn with me to the second portion here in Psalm 145. Psalm 145, and it's a very important psalm. We're not covering all of it. But the important details of the opening verses, we shall see something that also speaks to the deeper level of what I've been referencing broadly thus far. Psalm 145, if you'll begin with me in verse 1. I will extol you, my God and my King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Again, the insipid here, the beginning, utilizes the exact same terminology that we had just seen in the 95th Psalm. I will extol you. That is to say, I will exalt or I will elevate. uh, Literally from the Hebrew meaning to lift on high. Not Not necessarily as much as the fact that you or we are somehow lifting God on high, but rather we are acknowledging that he is lifted on high. He occupies a high and lofty place. This is why so often, uh, especially in the Hebrew, in the Old Testament, uh, we find God and the temple of God, the people of God, etc., figuratively referenced as being either a mountain or on top of a mountain. Right? We find many references to that, particularly in Isaiah, for example, prophesying about uh, this new Jerusalem, this new Zion, this new covenant that will come from his perspective, which now has as being a mountain to which the nations will come and and streams of living water will flow down from the top of the mountain. This notion of being high and elevated and lifted up has always, not just in the scriptures but even beyond that in pagan culture, been a reference or an allusion to the divine. Okay, So many pagan cultures, mountains were an important place. That's why this, well quite frankly this is why, the Blue Mountains are the kind of epicenter of the neo-pagan movements or the New Age spiritual movements in Australia because this is the mountaintop. That's not just by mere coincidence. Right? That's by design. The mountains and the high places are a reference to the holy places or the divine places. So I will extol you, I will exalt you, my God and King, monarchical reference once again, and I will bless your name forever and ever paralleled with verse 2 every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever why verse 3 tells us in a direct form great is the Lord and greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable again this is not the first not the second but now the third reference to the very existence and nature of God being the reason why he is to be worshipped. Great is Yahweh, great is the Lord, and therefore greatly to be praised. He is greatly to be praised because God is great. And why is God great? Because he's God and King. He is greatly to be praised and his greatness is unsearchable. 
Okay, this is this notion of the transcendence of God. Whilst also being imminent and present among us, whilst also having, in the second person, become incarnate, taken on human nature, human form, he is yet at the same time still transcendent, above and beyond. And ultimately, whilst he has revealed himself to us, both generally through nature, through the material world that exists, and then specifically or specially through his word, the scriptures, he is still on an ultimate level unsearchable. We can rationally understand the Trinity up unto a point. Okay? And this is not a shame, it's just the limits of our own finite mortality, of the fact that we're not divine, that we're not pre-existent or eternal. But nevertheless, God is great, and therefore greatly to be praised, because he is, as verse 1 says, our God and King. It further develops this concept in verses 8 and 9. So skim forward a bit to verse 8 and 9. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Now this is a direct quote on the part of the psalmist from Exodus 34 verse 6, which we exegeted in two parts, if you may recall, uh, kind of in the latter weeks of our series last year on the divine attributes, the mercy and the grace of God. Right? which in that original form says, the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love to the thousandth generation, etc., etc. Okay? This is a direct quote of that verse. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, i.e. unfailing love, continuing love. The Lord is good to all and his mercy is over all that he has made. What is the psalmist doing here? The Lord is gracious. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good. He is listing attributes of God. He's listing attributes. Not exhaustively, of course, because right? we spent 20 weeks and that wasn't exhaustive. But here, he's listing attributes. He's listing the attributes of God. He is deepening what he had originally said in verses 1 to 3. Okay, in this highlighting of the fact that God is great. That he is to be worshipped because he is God. And then he further explains it by listing and worshipping God for his various attributes which constitute his nature. Fundamentally what is going on here at the kind of macroscopic level when we zoom back out to the broader level of this psalm as well as Psalm 95. As I mentioned, this is the third time that the respective psalmists have identified the reason for worship and praise and doxology is the fact that God is God. This tells us at the broadest yet most foundational level that God fundamentally as the object of worship is to be worshipped for his very existence and nature. God is to be worshipped for his very existence and nature. Obviously those two things are not separate, they're completely and perfectly intertwined. But his very existence, the very fact that he in his being is God, is not only the reason to be worshipped, but is more than enough reason to be worshipped. His very existence as the eternal being, as the one who is from everlasting to everlasting, the one who's referred to as the Alpha and the Omega in the Greek, the one who is from the beginning to the end, the one who precedes all things, who has existed eternally beyond the very creation of time itself beyond the very existence of matter and space and time. That reality of him being the God, the creator, the almighty, is the fundamental reason why in his very being he is worthy to be worshipped. And that being is, of course, understood in his nature, in his attributes which we explored for the better part of five months last year. 
all those various attributes. And if you haven't seen that series or you haven't been with us, you can find that on our website or on our YouTube channel, right? Of this 20-part series we did on the divine attributes of God, who is God, as a fundamental expression or understanding of who this God is that we indeed worship. I'd encourage you to go back and look at those. But nevertheless, God's mere existence as the one divine being that is in fact eternal is the reason for worship. You do not need any other. Anything beyond that is merely a bonus. The things that we see, the actions, right? Of course, many of the Psalms detail the various and multitudinous things that God had done for his people, saving them from slavery in Egypt, rescuing them at the shores of the Red Sea, bringing them safely through the tumultuous wilderness, eventually bringing them across, of course, into the promised land, saving them from the onslaughts of the various pagan nations around them who constantly were assailing and warring against them. All these various things, and that's a very short list, but all of these various things are, of course, pointed to and highlighted as to why God is to be worshipped for the things that he does in the world and for his people. But as we saw, particularly from that series on the divine attributes, all of his actions flow forth from what? His nature. His actions are merely the expression of his attributes or his characteristics. They're not somehow detached from one another. Everything he does and is, is as a result of his character and being. And his actions are in perfect alignment and conformity to his nature. So that's why this concept is being highlighted, his nature. That's why the psalmist is pointing to his attributes. Right? Merciful, gracious, etc., etc. God is to be worshipped because he is. Do you understand? God is to be worshipped because he is. This is why the divine name given to Moses, his own self-reference when explicitly asked, who are you? I am that I am. Or I am who I am. Either way. I am. Who are you? Me. And who is that? Me. I am who I am. This is who he is. This is how he reveals and explains himself. Because there is nothing else to be compared to. There is nothing that can be compared to. Any other possible analogy simply falls short by virtue of the fact that it is created. (laughs) It already fails that fundamental premise. Any great gigantic thing that we as human beings would look at with awe and wonder was ultimately created by him is ultimately corporeal and mortal as opposed to eternal and immortal. There is nothing which we can use as a proverbial analogy, as a figure of speech to somehow conceptualise the eternal God. He is worthy to be worshipped because he is. Because he was, is, will be. This is what is being highlighted to us. The very fact that he is God. That's why we've seen three times the fundamental reason as to why is God to be worshipped? Because he is God. (laughs) So understand these vitally important points to this notion of the object of our worship. God is to be worshipped because of his very mere existence and nature. It demands and commands worship. It is inherently worthy of being praised and glorified because he is. Moreover, as a result of that, by virtue of the fact that we are coming into the presence, as the Psalms tell us, of this very eternal creator, this one who is referred to as the Almighty, the Ancient of Days, we are to then come with a commensurate level of reverence and respect and awe, fear in the worthy and legitimate sense, in our worship of him. We are not to do it with triviality nor with casualness. We are not to come here as if this is just some social club, some community group, 
that we're coming here to sing nice songs and have some tea and scones. Rather, we are coming into the presence of the Almighty to pay him the reverence and respect that he is due. A, because we owe it, and B, because we have the freedom to do so by virtue of the fact that we will never pay off the debt, nor are we expected to, because the debt has been paid. By whom? The very same God, who has paid our debt. And so we have the freedom, we have the liberty, we have the privilege to worship God in spirit and in truth, to come and worship the true God in the true way. This is a privilege of ours, yet also a duty, because we see, so often do we not, worship is commanded. Again, these kinds of statements here, you know, come let us sing to the Lord, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving, come let us worship and bow down, these are not mere suggestions. They're not recommendations for how to make your life better or nicer to improve your finances or your social standing or anything else in between. These are commandments coming through the prophets and the kings from God. When you read here, especially like in Psalm 95, come let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord our maker, hint, it's the maker who's saying that. So reverence and respect or a sense of gravitas and seriousness to these ventures, to what we do verbally and vocationally in our worship, must be an inherent component of that. By gravitas, I mean in the Roman sense, this sense of weightiness or gravity, sense of seriousness and composure. That must inform and build the worship that we do in the worship service and in everything else that we do beyond that, because all these things are an expression of worship. It doesn't mean that we're morose, right? It doesn't mean that we're all saddened and super duper serious and don't say hello to anyone, don't look anyone in the eyes. It's not, it's not about that, okay? But it is an intentional drive to eliminate triviality, to eliminate casualness, flippancy. Right? We don't just come in here and, hey guys, let's just sing some songs, or let's just, let's just pray quickly for blah, blah, blah. Hmm? If you knew how much time Michael spends preparing those pastoral prayers, you'd probably be shocked. And that's just the pastoral prayer, let alone the other ones. I don't come in here and just, hey guys, I found this cool thing in the scriptures that I thought would really brighten your day. Reverence and respect, a deep sense of what we're doing here that demonstrates the fact that, and this is a really important point to make, please understand this, it's especially important for our day. By having a true sentiment of reverence and respect, what it does, among many other things, but what it does is it detaches us from this isolated time period in which we happen to be doing this. Okay? What I mean by that is this. When we carry in our worship and in the engagement thereof a commensurate level, an appropriate level, and an accurate level of reverence and respect, what we're doing is we're acknowledging that we are undertaking and participating in something that, as I mentioned to this point, billions of people not just today, but before us, across the course of thousands upon thousands of years, have also done. Does, does that make sense? We're engaging with those who have lived before us, who have walked in these very same ways, who have read these very same scriptures, who have sung many of the same songs that we sing. You know, we're going to close the, the service with Be Thou My Vision. Right? And the original text from Be Thou My Vision comes from 1,400 years ago. That is a text that traces back 
to the early 7th century. Right? Those lyrics have been known by Christians, particularly in the British Isles and in Europe, for nearly one and a half thousand years. Now you may recall during Advent, I, we gave that explainer of the great Advent antiphons, right? the, the fundamental ancient text that made up the, the Christmas carol, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel. Right? That text goes back to the year 500 AD. Those lyrics have been sung and proclaimed among the saints of God for one and a half thousand years years. That should weigh on your heart and mind. It should weigh. It should account to you that we're not just in this little isolated pocket of doing our little thing in our little individual lives. We are in fact joining with not just those in the world today, but those who have come before us for thousands of years. All united in one common factor, the worship, the adoration, the glorification of that one and the same God. This is what drives us. This is what must inform the way in which we worship this very object of worship, who is this great God and King, our maker, whom we are commanded to bow down and to worship. And so glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, unto the ages of ages. Amen.